Hey dad, wouldn't it be nice if your favorite bar decided to give you unlimited drinks just for being a swell guy? But what if I told you the people gifting you the booze were peeking at you from behind their own glasses, hoping that you would drink yourself to death? Not so great anymore, huh? What if I told you that if you didn't drink yourself to death, they were going to devise even more ways to see you die, like a sinister game they were playing with your life? Well, that's exactly what four men did to an old drunk vagabond during the Great Depression. What the men could not have anticipated was their target was the toughest son of a bitch any of them had ever seen. This is a rather satisfying story of hardship and triumph, stirring some greed and murder. But don't forget to chase it down with justice. Do you want to hear it or not, old man? Let's go ahead and meet our protagonist, Mike Malloy. Born in Ireland in 1873, eventually migrating to the US of A and finding work as a fireman in New York. But then the Great Depression took its toll, and it was hard for working folk, but was especially hard on Malloy as he wound up homeless and now well into his 50s. He was also an alcoholic during the Prohibition, so no breaks for you, Malloy. But luckily, a local speakeasy was there for him to wet his tongue when he pandered enough for a drink. So Malloy, every day, would frequent the speakeasy of a man named Tony Marino, a 27-year-old businessman and an all-around unsavory character. Now Marino hadn't much interest in the likes of a man like Malloy, but on one random day, if Malloy was a bit more observant, he would have noticed how odd it was that Marino and his bartender, Joseph Murphy, were being strangely nice to him. The greetings were on a human level, and there also seemed to be a bit more patrons than usual. Two more to be exact, enjoying some of that bathtub hooch. Now Malloy and these strangers would strike up that superficial bond that occurs when alcohol is flowing. The men found Malloy a complete joy to be around, and everybody took turns buying him a drink. And drink he did, throwing back any free drinks coming his way like a champion. Marino wanted to make his own contributions to what a swell guy Mike Malloy was, so he told Murphy to give him unlimited booze, free of charge. Malloy's heart filled with joy, as well as a dangerous amount of alcohol, enough to kill everyone in the bar. But not a man like Malloy. His liver was forged in the finest whiskey barrels itself, it seemed, as he downed a few more beers, chased it with a few more shots, and by now, in the utter bewilderment and disgust of the once jovial men, Malloy had the nerve to only look tipsy. Marino decided to close up shop before Malloy shuttered it for him. No one had seen anything like this before and witnesses that night would share this story at other speakeasies, earning Malloy the nickname Iron Mike. So of course, we could deduce that Marino was not giving away alcohol from the kindness of his heart. The bartender and the other two men buying him drinks didn't like him particularly either. Here's what went down prior to this night. So here we meet the main antagonists, Marino and three of his friends who were Joseph Murphy, the bartender, Francis Pasqua, a 24-year-old undertaker, and Daniel Kreisberg, a 29-year-old grocer, all as unsavory as Marino. So one day, they were brainstorming some fast ways to score money. That's when Marino suggested the idea of insurance fraud. The plan was to take out a policy on someone under a false name with false ID cards, in which one of the men would later claim kinship to that somebody with more false IDs when the victim met his end. Marino bragged that he had successfully done this very scam before with an old homeless lady, so he already had the blueprint to make this work. The payout was to be 3,500 big ones, $70,000 in today's money. The one caveat was it had to be an accidental death. Now all they needed was a victim, and having witnessed Mike Malloy every night as an old down bad vagrant with hardly a soul to miss him, he was their perfect mark. 
So that first plot was supposed to be simple. Have Mike Malloy drink himself to death, and when that didn't happen, they decided to try the same ruse the following night, and Malloy would sit there, alcohol up to his throat, giving everyone a shit-eating grin. The night after that, as a happy Malloy enters his favorite place in the world, Marino again offers him unlimited drinks, but unbeknownst to Malloy, it was bartender's choice night. Each drink would have a most special mix. Antifreeze. And Malloy began to pound them down again and again, and as everybody waited patiently for the man to kill over, nothing happened. But why? It's because alcoholic drinks contain ethanol, which blocks ethylene glycol, the crystallizing kill agent in antifreeze, from being absorbed by the liver. This Irishman was tough and lucky. Seeing that Malloy was guzzling antifreeze like he was a carburetor for a Model T himself, Marino pops open the turpentine. Malloy is given the drink. This had to be it. He downs the strange tasting drink and stares into Marino's eyes in fear that Marino wouldn't give him another one. I'm sure all the men slap their foreheads at this point as they angrily disappear to make another drink. This time, they try horse liniment, a topical cream for muscle aches and such, but a death wish if consumed. Mike drank it, and wouldn't you know, he was moving around free of aches and pains. The men finally said, fuck this, and straight mixed in rat poison, which was composed of arsenic from back in those days. Mike downed it and had the audacity to remain alive. So as I mentioned before that alcohol contains ethanol, produced when grains and fruits are fermented. And then there is methanol, the simplest form of alcohol but a lot more volatile if ingested. Well Marino put that into the drink and watched as Mike, who was earning his new nickname Mike the Durable, as he tipped glass after glass over like a parched man drinking water. So the problem with Marino's methanol cocktail was, it was in an alcoholic drink. The ethanol was negating the methanol. But these men weren't doing this because they were bright. No, but because they were ruthless. The group put their heads together and Pasqua said that he once witnessed a man die while eating oysters and drinking whiskey. Marino got his remaining methanol and gave a generous drizzle over some raw oysters because why not? Old Mike Malloy was overjoyed to have his great friends notice his grumbling stomach. He ate all the oysters, he burped, he farted, all the sounds and smells of life. The group, now realizing that ingestion was no way to end the likes of Malloy, were at a loss at what to do next. Until Mother Nature herself gave them a hint, when by the following evening she made one of the coldest nights and dumped white snow all over the neighborhood. So on that icy evening, after running up his unlimited tab again, Malloy passed out on the bar counter. Marino and the boys picked him up and carried him out to the nearby park where they ripped open his shirt to expose him further to the elements and left him on a park bench. Now for good measure. They poured five gallons of water on him and fled. Back at the bar, the men were in good spirits because there was no way, right? Well, that of course was when on the following night, the Irish Rasputin, which is another nickname that was given him, plopped himself on Marino's bar stool, ready for more of that endless fountain. The story he would share was that he didn't know how he got there, but the police found him on a park bench and took him to a homeless shelter where he was given new clothes and spent a warm night and complained about a bit of a cold. To Marino and his men, this absurdity needed to end because at this point time was of the essence. They were paying a premium for that insurance policy, and each night that went by ate into the profits. Sadly for our hero though, the men wouldn't be as subtle or discreet with their next attempt. They hired a shady taxi driver named Hershey Green to spot Malloy and just run him over with his cab. So while cruising around the block for that perfect opportunity when nobody was around, he saw Malloy stumbling about and at 45 miles an hour crushed him under his tires and fled. Green reported back to the men that Mike Malloy was dead and they happily paid him $150. 
soon after trying to claim the money from the insurance company. They were informed that that was not possible because the juggernaut, another nickname of course, was still alive and recovering from broken bones. The crew was at wit's end. This truly could not be happening. But it was. Three weeks later, a smiling homeless Irishman walks into a bar and if you listened closely enough, the sound of four guys sighing could be heard. But as superhuman as Mike Malloy was, he would not be able to withstand what his friends did to him next. After falling asleep at the bar again, Murphy the bartender, who also lived at the speakeasy, helped carry Malloy to his room along with the other men. They laid him down next to a coal gas jet, which was the gas used for lighting and fuel back in those days before natural gas. They attached a hose to the jet, the other end was shoved down Malloy's throat, and they turned it on. And even this took almost an hour, but they had finally done it. Malloy's body was found on the sidewalk the following day, and the medical examiner, Dr. Frank Manzella, declared that the cause of death was low bar pneumonia. Already a legend of speakeasies near and far, Malloy's death sealed and expanded his legacy even further. One night, some officers were enjoying a speakeasy on their night off, heard that Malloy had died, and a few extra interesting tidbits to go along with it. One being that the durable Mike Malloy was killed by a group of men for insurance. With not much to go on but drunken gossip, the officers didn't give it much heed. But then things began to align, and the gossip didn't seem so far-fetched when four men basically imploded on each other. Turns out, they spent $2,000 to kill Mike Malloy, so that only netted them $1,500 to split four ways. And that made a fiery Kreisberg extremely disgruntled with his cut, because he was counting on a full payment to take care of his wife and three kids, which led to a heated argument in which Murphy pulls out a pistol and shoots Kreisberg right outside Marino's speakeasy. Kreisberg was not mortally wounded. But the speakeasy was when the police arrived. After detectives learned that this was the bar that one Mike Malloy frequented, those rumors of the speakeasies came to mind. All loyalties were out the window when during interrogation, they ratted each other out trying to save their own skin at just the mention of Mike Malloy's name. They exhumed Malloy's body and under the examination of an uncorrupted examiner, it was forensically determined that Mike had not died of low bar pneumonia at all. More like coal gas inhalation. And the whole story was eventually corroborated as they rounded up even more bad actors. So at the trial, Hershey Green, the cab driver, got life in prison, and Dr. Manzella, who turned out to be a close friend of Marino's, was held on $10,000 bail for falsifying the death certificate. Now, I don't always get a sense of justice in many of these murder cases, but this one, Dad, made me imagine Malloy up in heaven with God's arm resting on his shoulder, assuring him, don't worry, Mike, I got this. Marino. Pasqua, Kreisberg, and Murphy were sentenced to death, and between June 7th and July 5th of 1934, they all got a chance to sit on a bulky chair at the Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York as 2,000 volts, a vote for every dollar they spent to kill Malloy, jolted through their bodies. Now picture Mike Malloy laughing in heaven as each man died on a mere one try. I hope you enjoyed the story, Dad. I love you. Have yourself a good night. And I'll be back shortly with another.